Okay. Good morning and welcome to the 34th meeting of the Economy, Energy and um, Fair Work Committee for 2018. May I ask everyone to turn electrical devices to silent or off if they interfere with the sound system. Um, decision, uh, the first of all, we have apologies from committee member Dean Lockhart. Uh, item one on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items six and seven in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. And today we're looking at subordinate legislation, the Common Financial Tool Scotland Regulations 2018. And in that context, I would like to welcome the Minister, Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills. Uh, with him, he has Richard Dennis from the Office of the Accountant in Bankruptcy uh, Agency, a Chief Executive of that. John Cook, who is Executive Director of Case Operations and Deputy Accountant in Bankruptcy from the AIB's office. So welcome to all three of you. And uh, I think, first of all, I'm to invite the Minister to make an opening statement. Thank you uh, very much, Convener Kai. I begin by saying I'm pleased to have the opportunity to appear before the, the committee today to discuss the issues and indeed the concerns that have been raised in, in connection with the Common Financial Tool uh, as applied to Scotland's statutory uh, debt solutions. Can I say at the outset, uh, can I recognise that it's twice now I've withdrawn uh, these regulations? I uh, recognise that as uh, unusual. I want to make very clear that I am not intending making a habit of uh, that being uh, a feature of bringing forward uh, secondary legislation to the committee. The first time it was, of course, uh, in relation to stakeholder feedback, um, who were telling us they needed some more time to be ready for the expected introdu introduction of the, uh, the regulations coming into force. The second time, of course, was due to the concerns that you had heard uh, as a committee, uh, concerns which I wanted to explore uh, further. Uh, I am aware uh, that the committee has already taken evidence from two panels of witnesses on the adoption of the standard financial statement, the SFS. Uh, I welcome uh, the fact that you as a committee have written to me uh, following the evidence sessions to set out some of the, the concerns that were identified. As you will uh, note from the letters that both uh, Richard Dennis and I have sent to the committee since uh, those panel sessions. I am still of the view that we should move to adopt the SFS, but uh, I do recognise that concerns have been expressed and these clearly need to be discussed and uh, addressed. The letters uh, that have been sent set out my position in relation to concerns, but uh, I, don't, uh, so I don't propose to, to repeat those in detail, but of course we'd be very happy to explore those matters uh, during today's session. I would uh, say, convener, my overriding concern here is that the continued use of the common financial statement, which is of course the tool that's currently utilised uh, even over the short term, it could be detrimental to those in Scotland faced with problem uh, debt. Uh, that will be the outcome if the uh, current regulations remain uh, in force. The committee has taken evidence. There should be consideration of uh, an entirely new way of assessing contributions made in insolvency. Other uh, countries' experience, other models used have been highlighted. Uh, what I would say in relation to that, Commissioner, that does, uh, of course, open up debate. I think that's a welcome debate, and we should always look to learn uh, from uh, others and uh, improve the landscape here in Scotland. But, of course, that would, I believe, require uh, consultation, a far more detailed assessment of the wider impact of such a change. I'm happy to have those discussions. Plans are already in place to consult on the reforms introduced in 2014, but this will be a slightly longer term legislative process and right now we have a decision before us in the simplest terms the choice at present is a, a straightforward one we either remain with the status quo the CFS or switch to the SFS as the adopted common financial tool if the reasons I, I've set out I mean of, of the view the adoption of the SFS provides advantages for those dealing with debt which is of course absolutely critical as the committee will know I met with Stakeholders last week to find out uh, firsthand the practical issues arising in relation to the common financial tool and its application. Uh, I can say to the committee, I invited all those who had provided evidence to you uh, and uh, many uh, attended. Uh, this was an enormously helpful discussion uh, for me. Uh, what it revealed to me was that uh, many of the concerns from the advice community were predominantly about application of the common financial tool either uh, under its current guise, uh, the CFS, or indeed prospectively the SFS, rather than the tools themselves. This brought uh, 
into sharp focus the need for ever closer collaboration between the accountant and bankruptcy and the advice community to develop and agree guidance that affords the flexibility and pragmatism that is required. We agreed uh, that we desire, I think everyone around the table uh, agreed that we desire a system that serves to protect those that are in financially vulnerable position, but also one that does not create unnecessary administrative burden for all involved. I think it is that aspect that is absolutely critical and it's a priority that the work on revised and agreed guidance progresses at a pace. The meeting also touched on a more general debate about the other models, uh, as I've uh, alluded to. Uh, and as I've said, uh, I'm clear that that is open for discussion, but through the, the planned policy uh, review of the reforms introduced in 2015. Uh, my next uh, proposed steps at uh, Convener uh, are that we engage very quickly with stakeholders. The standing working group that looks at the common financial tool will meet tomorrow uh, to discuss issues around the guidance that should accompany any new regulations and also the concerns about the a burden of evidence required through either a mechanism. Those uh, I met with last week can, will be involved in that process. Uh, many of them are already on uh, the working group, uh, and that uh, purpose will be to ensure revised clear guidance for operating the common financial tool uh, to be in place uh, uh, and to, uh, be sec to secure buy-in to that process. And I'm uh, obviously very keen that the committee can be part of that process as well. Once that is in place, I would then plan to provide the revised guidance uh, alongside regulations to introduce SFS, uh, which I plan at present to relay before Parliament in uh, the new year. I look forward to being able to discuss this with the committee this morning. Thank you, Minister. Um, first of all, may I ask about the meeting that you mentioned? Is there a list of those who were invited and a list of those who did attend? Uh, yeah. that could be provided to the committee. I, d I don't need it now, but um, could that be provided to the committee, please? And also, is there a record of what was discussed um, which could also be provided to the committee? The short answer is, is yes. I could read out the list. It's rather late. Well, I'm so not would, asking you to. That. My point is, is there a list that can be provided to the committee of those invited and those who did attend and also a record of, of the meeting, such as okay, may have well, been kept? I'll, I'll stick with the short answer then, convener. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Now, I, I just want to ask briefly about one or two things in the letter that you wrote in response to my letter as convener of the committee on this matter, just, just to clarify one or two things. Um, first of all, you've mentioned in your letter, I think it's in the, the fourth paragraph, about uh, step change and the, the sound financial statement, uh, trigger breach issues and so forth. You refer to evidence supplementary written evidence, I think, provided to the committee. Is all of the evidence in that paragraph you refer to, is that evidence that's already been provided to the committee, or does that include supplementary information that may have been given to yourself or the AIB? I believe it's the, the what I refer to there is the evidence that was provided, my understanding is the evidence provided to you, um, but clearly, uh, as I've laid out, there's the further evidence um, that or the information, feedback that I was provided at the meeting that you just referred to. Yes, so that apart from the meeting was really what I was trying to clarify. Well, as far as I'm well know, it's, it's as I've referred to what was provided to you. Um, thank you. And I want to just ask about the, the methodology for calculating trigger figures used in the Standard Financial Statement or SFS uh, methodology. Um, is different than that under the CFS, or Common Financial um, Statement. Mm -hmm. Now, if one is making comparisons then between the figures arrived at, are these comparisons valid or useful or indeed misleading, if in fact they use different methodology? I, I don't think they're misleading. I think uh, they're predicated in the fact that one tool is in place and has and indeed has been uh, updated for the, the coming year. Um, so that's a, a tool that's available now. That's the one we propose to move to. The other one is a tool that uh, the uh, organisation which has developed it, devised it, that has been uh, keeping it um, uh, under uh, availability for licence. Uh, the Money Advice uh, Trust uh, is proposing not to, to maintain that going forward. Um, now, what we have done is we've made our best effort to try and have as uh, valid a comparison as is possible. Now, if there's a suggested 
other way of doing it, um, then there still is some available time for us to look at that again. But we've certainly not done anything that uh, I think could be construed as an attempt to, to mislead. Yeah. Well, so, so you accept there, there's a difference in the methodology and what you say has been attempted is to make as good a comparison as can be made between yes. the figures arrived at by different methods? It, it's certainly our best attempt to try and have as, equi and as equivalent a comparison as is possible in recognition that the tools are not identical. I can ask uh, Richard Dennis or, or uh, John Cook to maybe elaborate that on that a little more. Uh, what I can also say, uh, convener, is that, again, on the basis of uh, the, uh, the figure being operated, again, we've undertaken a similar exercise, uh, applying uh, the OBR's uh, predicted rate of inflation for the coming financial year to the CFS uh, to have another uh, attempt at comparison, uh, again, which we are, we're happy to share with the committee. It, it shows that uh, the position that we have laid out, that there are fewer trigger breaches under what we propose to move to, as is put in place uh, just now, it continues to be the case. But I don't know if... Well, it, might, it might be helpful to have an explanation of the, um, the changes made to the SFS methodology and uh, what, what effect that's had on the trigger figures, if that's I'm possible from I'm yourself to, or one of the other witnesses. Yes, I'm happy to, to hand over to uh, Richard or, or John on that. Um, uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr Chair, and good morning, committee. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep this as simple as I can. Um, so, um, yes, the two tools have a different methodology. Uh, they use different ways of calculating the trigger figures, and there are different categories within each set of trigger figures. So the SFS only has three triggered, figure, triggered categories. The CF, CFS has four. And, and there are different things in, in the two sets. Now, um, the 2017 trigger figures for the standard financial statement um, produced some surprising results um, when they were applied in practice in terms of generating higher contributions um, that might have been expected. So there was a look again at the methodology. Two things were then done when they were updated into 2018. First is that they, to calculate average spending in, in the group of folk they look, look at set the trigger figures, they disregard outliers. So people who report very low expenditure and people who report very high expenditure um, because it, 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 it's based on income, not expenditure. And one of the most significant changes in the SFS was that rather than using people who were reporting expenditure below the level of job seekers allowance disregard, they moved to using a disregard those reporting expenditure below the universal credit disregard. The impact of that um, was, in fact, and rather su surprising, and, and the minister and some members of the committee will have heard the creditors say this around the table at our meeting, they were surprised at the extent of that which drove up the trigger figures in the SFS. Um, now, that change in methodology for the SFS from 2017 to 2018 was because the 2017 figures were widely perceived as being too low. Uh, there was no such concerns about the CFS numbers. Their methodology has rolled forward for, I think, five or six years since it was last reviewed, um, and, that, and that wasn't changed. I mean, I does would, that, does I that would, help? I would make the point, of course, uh, convener, of uh, there is suggested further assessment that um, uh, we can undertake, and it would be sensible to undertake, then we are we're very open to that uh, prospect. Right. I think Jackie Bailey has a follow-up on this point. Well, well that, that's specific, and I'm very grateful for you simplifying it for us on the committee. Um, if universal credit was the base cut-off, if you like, um, for the standard financial tool, and the effect was to drive up the trigger figures, why didn't you use that to assess the common financial tool? Um, it is slightly more complicated than that, and... and you know, there are long, lengthy documents explaining the met methodology for the two, which the committee are, are welcome, welcome to see. Um, if you make the methodology for calculating the trigger figures the same in both tools, then you will get the same answer, because the, same, the two tools will be the same. So uh, effectively, by moving to the SFS, all you are doing is changing the CFS to adopt the SFS trigger figure methodology and categorisation. 
So, so there wouldn't be a point because you'd only have one tool rather than two. OK, but the point is, at the moment, as you've acknowledged, you're not comparing the same thing. And I think, therefore, the, it, the advantage or disadvantage isn't instantly obvious because we're not from starting from the same baseline. I, I suppose my, my, my observation in response to that, Ms Bailey, would be the scale of assessment that's been undertaken in respect of both. So I'm aware that there was an assessment, I think it was Money Advice Scotland, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. There's Money Advice Scotland, Money Advice Service, Money Advice Trust Convener. It can get confusing. Complicated. I need these things simplified for me as well, Ms Bailey. Uh, okay. the, uh, the numbers that they, and this isn't criticism incidentally, but the numbers they un, uh, that they assessed were um, quite small. Uh, the numbers that we assessed were uh, the first time uh, round, once the uh, figures were uprated, were 1,500. Now that it's been uprated again, I think we're about 2,100 uh, cases. That would say to me that's quite a substantial body of evidence. But I, I, I make the point, uh, convener, of um, uh, it's something the committee um, really desires to, then we will go back and see if it can be done. Um, we will have, we will make that commitment. Um, but I think the point that Dr. Dennis has made is that our expectation would be that it wouldn't be substantially uh, different. Thank you, convener. And we would welcome the information you choose to send us. Of course. Um, thank you. Uh, just one final question of clarification for me on your letter, Minister, but I think it may be an issue more for Richard Dennis to respond to than, than yourself, although it's covered in your letter. Um, you noted that the AIB had consulted with Christians Against Poverty, or CAP, and stated their chief executive confirmed the organisation is fully supportive of the SFS. Um, now, I just wanted to ask what that means. Um, so I think you've been relying on information from the AIB, so it might be easier for the AIB to respond to that. Well, I, I can certainly ha hand over, it is uh, the case that, uh, uh, as is always, the, you rely on your officials to provide you Yes, evidence. no, no, I'm not questioning so, that. I'm just saying for that reason it might be easier for them to uh, address the basis of well, that you, statement you, you in your can, letter. You can address your questions to whoever you wish, can be, but uh, <laughs> I'll hand over to Dr. Davis then. Um, just, just to say, we, I mean, I think that particular reference might have been to PayPlan, but both PayPlan and Christians Against Poverty um, have both confirmed they are moving to use the SFS in their own systems um, by, I think, in both cases, the end of March. So they have both already committed to adopting the SFS. This is for the UK? That, this is for the UK. So for both, if Scotland were to maintain with the CFS, we'd be asking both to run two systems. Well, presumably they would have to move to the SFS for England anyway. Um, if that's the system used. So well, what I'm interested in, just to make clear, is the suggestion that they are fully supportive of this change. So I'm interested in uh, what precisely they've been asked or they've said. Is there, is there uh, again, a record of this information that could be provided to the committee confirming their position, or what is it you're referring to when you say this? Yes, I think we could. We can provide further evidence uh, on that basis. Um, we, we, we can, and the, the letter from the paper plan chief executive is quoted in one of my letters to you, I think, verbatim. Right. Well, I was I was interested in CAP, but you've referred to a pay plan. So, is there? A um, yes. Again, well, we have we have written material from them, which we're more than yep. happy to make available to the committee. Thank you. I'll now turn to John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, as I understood it, one of the uh, bodies that took part on Thursday, although I think by the phone conference, uh, was the Money Advice Trust, who currently operate the Common Financial Statement. Um, now, they're not planning to carry on maintaining it after March or April, um, but they didn't seem to rule out that it would be impossible. So, I mean, is it an option that either they or the government or someone uh, maintains the common financial statement after March? Uh, y yes, uh, uh, <coughs> it is. Um, that's clear, I mean, to be candid with you, it can be, that's clearly a practicality we are having to explore now, given that we don't want there to be any uh, gap in provision um, 
because I'm not preempting the. It would be very presumptuous of me to to preempt the committee's decision. So we're having to get engaged in, in that territory. Uh, and as um, you would expect, uh, they being an organisation that has the best interests of uh, vulnerable people at heart, they wouldn't want that either. So on a practical basis, yes, I think it is something they could do. I suppose the question would be on a long-term basis what the, the governance arrangements for either financial tool would be. So once, right now, as far as I'm aware, there's a steering group with a range of agencies involved in uh, assessing the, the efficacy of uh, the CFS. Um, given that the trust don't envisage continuing it, that that infrastructure is going to uh, to not exist anymore, whereas there is a, a, a group, an equivalent group uh, for the SFS. Yeah, of which, incidentally, um, Citizens by Scotland, Money by Scotland and the Accountant Bankruptcy would be part of, which they're not just now under CFS, which is uh, probably a moot point given the group is going to, to disappear. But the point I make is you're not going to have that wider <coughs> group with all the, the relevant stakeholder interests in, involved in, in monitoring the efficacy of that as a tool. But theoretically, yes. OK, thank you. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that wor worried the committee was, you know, we were shown some spending guidelines for under SFS and under uh, CFS. And I think the point came out from that, that in 2017, as has already been said this morning, the SFS guidelines were relatively low and increased for 2018. Mm -hmm. But we still got the impression that they were lower than the equivalent spending guidelines for CFS. Now, I, are you saying that's not the case? The well, cl clearly this is, I mean, I recognise this is, is ultimately at the nub of the issue. So our analysis says no, and some of the evidence you have been provided with is to the contrary. So we think our evidence is robust. We think, given the scale of the assessment, that we can demonstrate that's the case. As I say, after the last operating, some 1,500 cases were reviewed. Uh, the latest one... Uh, just over 2,100. We'll provide that uh, as supplementary information to the committee again. So, so you're saying that there were more trigger breaches? No, That's the figures you're talking about, is it? No, no, I'm saying that we undertook a, a fairly comprehensive assessment. There were fewer trigger breaches. R right, OK. But I, I'm, I'm talking about the actual sp spending guidelines in mm -hmm. pound terms, yeah. which we were told were, were higher, i.e., I understand people could have more to live on, under CFS in 2018 uh, than I'm, they would have I'm under... Not in, I'm not sure that's... That, that you think that's not the case? The case. I'll hand over to John on that point. No, we don't believe that is the case. We think that the standard financial statement uh, gives, a, gives more sustainable returns. It's interesting, I think, that the Money Advice Trust, who, who set up the, the common financial statement, at the meeting last week, they made it clear that the standard financial statement is an evolution of that tool and they support the implementation of the standard financial statement. And what it does do is allow more sustainable outcomes uh, for, for debtors. And, and we think, certainly, that's in the best interest of the people of Scotland to, to make that move at this point in time. When you say more sustainable outcomes, do you mean more money? Essentially, yes. Uh, we mentioned the point about sure trigger breaches. Now, if a trigger's breached, then what happens normally is we would seek evidence uh, from the person who submit the application to establish, you know, their circumstances. If there are fewer breaches, that doesn't have to happen. So we don't need to go through that process, which means it's unlikely that people would pay more. There is a likelihood if people are breaching triggers, they'd have to pay more in way of a contribution. Uh, so this process should stop that happening in as many cases as it happens at the moment, and that's what our statistics show. Although, again, it was suggested last week that I think for travel, the, the trigger breach, is, it, it, the trigger is zero because it, all the travel has to be evidenced. That, that, that's a good point. I, I think under the sorry, Minister. Well, I, I, again, I think this comes to the uh, part of the issue. So I, I think, um, in respect of that, the concern is about the um, the burden of evidence and how reasonable that um, the accountant bankruptcy will be in undertaking assessment. Now. Uh, my my expectation as the minister responsible is that accountant bankruptcy will be reasonable. I have no doubt if I was to hand over to either Richard or John right now, they would say that they are reasonable uh, in the application of any 
guidance or rules. What I can say, and to be quite upfront and candid, it can be there is that there was a sense at the meeting last week that some stakeholders don't necessarily feel that is always the case. So there's a disconnect there. So that's why I have uh, concluded that the most appropriate thing for us to do is to get everyone together to discuss that further so that we can have agreed guidance that shows that uh, the accountant bankruptcy isn't going to expect every single uh, bus ticket to be returned where it is unnecessary to do. One, because it won't be possible for everyone to do that, uh, and more likely, actually, um, it will be unnecessary because the, the costs are, are low. That said, of course, and of course we need to remember that certainly for, because this is applied across all the, the various products for dealing with a debt situation there can be, and we need to take creditors with us certainly for those elements where they have to uh, agree, such as the debt arrangement uh, scheme. So we need to make sure that uh, there is still some form of mechanism within the system that evidence has to be provided. Otherwise, I think we would be at danger of losing some creditor at buy-in. And for that element, I think we would all agree, I was here recently at the committee, and we were all agreeing that the debt arrangement scheme is a very good model because it avoids people having to end up becoming bankrupt on a protected trust deed. And if my concern would be if creditors don't buy into the system, more people are going to be pushed down that avenue. Okay. But, of course, we have to get the balance right. And that's what I'm determined we can do. And I want to get people to, to buy into that. And, of course, that includes the committee. All right. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mira. Minister, um, the only apparent driver for introducing SFS is to achieve a standardised approach across the UK on income assessment. Would the Minister accept that as a, a result of the introduction of the CFS for statutory debt solutions, Scotland already has standardised income assessment in both formal and informal debt solutions? On the latter point, largely, uh, yes. On the former, um, I, I wouldn't say that's the only uh, driver. I don't think that's the only... If that had been the overwhelming uh, concern and the assessment that had been undertaken showed that actually more people were going to be negatively impacted, you can imagine what my response would have been. So I think the... Um, the inherent advantages of having a more simplified and straightforward system using one tool would have been outweighed by my concern that more people were going to be negatively impacted. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's the over, overriding uh, concern. But I'll bring in uh, Richard on that point. Um, uh, just to add a slight rider on that, um, the common financial statement is common across the statutory debt solutions. Um, it's not necessarily widespread use in the non-statutory, and there are more non-statutory than statutory. Um, we can't, in fact, tell you the exact numbers, but we can tell you there are, there are more and there are a lot of them. Um, and increasingly, because they are run by big firms working at the UK level, they will be running off the standard financial statement. Now, just carrying on from that, in the past it's been highlighted about the cost of running two systems for debt advice organisations that operate both in Scotland and south of the border. However, the costs wouldn't arise for organisations only in Scotland. Do you have a breakdown of the bodies providing debt advice in Scotland and what percentage of the market is covered by organisations which work only in Scotland? Uh, not before me. Um, candidly, I don't know if that is available, um, uh, but John might be about to say it is. Um, well, I'll let him answer on that basis. If it is, then yes. If it's not, then it's something we'd need to try and pull together. I don't know how readily that would be achieved, but John? Yeah, we do keep statistics of uh, trustees and, and bankruptcy and protected trustees and even for uh, debt arrangement scheme, and the money advisors in place. So we can pull out those statistics. What I can say is that some of these products are dominated by big providers who operate both north and south of the border. But we can, we can get these figures for you, absolutely, yes. It would be interesting to see that. Yes. Um, are there any other ways that adopting the SFS rather than continuing to use the CFS would benefit debtors and advisors in Scotland? 
Well, I suppose the fundamental one, and it goes back to uh, the assessment we've undertaken, is that I think more debtors will benefit through a, a, a lower number of triggered breaches, and I think the assessment we've undertaken can demonstrate that to be the case. So I would say that's a fairly fundamental benefit to those who are debtors. So the, the, your, your primary concern here is to reduce the number of triggers? Um, it's certainly uh, always going to be a feature of my consideration. It's going to be uppermost in my mind, but there are a variety of other uh, issues at play here. One, yes, there's the issues about having a straightforward system for also those who uh, are involved in the provision of uh, advice, and uh, I think we've touched on that as well. But there's also the very practical consideration, although I have obviously conceded the point that we could work around it. Uh, but the practical consideration of the fact that the existing uh, mechanism, the CFS, is about to be switched off by the, the people who administer it and who license it. I seem to, you can correct me here, but my memory tells me that uh, there's an, a number of different systems in use south of the border. Do we know if there's an intention to bring in the SFS as a standardised system there? The, there is. Clearly, we have a different uh, approach here in that we've, on a um, more long-standing basis, had this as a, a matter of legislation. But yes, that is my understanding. Are they going to be able to achieve that, given the diversity of uh, the different organisations and the different priorities and so on that we see? Uh, I think I'll probably hand over to, to Rich that in terms of that being a sort of practical issue that he's more, probably more likely to be in touch with those involved at south of the border. I guess, just to, just to explain, my concern is that down the line, are we going to be coming back and revisiting that? Because some major organisations south of the border have decided to... Well, I, 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 we can never preclude that possibility. Um, because ultimately, um, and I've made the point already, we intend to review the legislation that was passed, the system that's been in place, um, we're open-minded to having that discussion about what ultimately is um, it best for people utilising this system. I would reflect on the fact that at the time of the introduction of these regulations, there was consultation and uh, a majority of uh, people felt that we should use uh, an existing tool. And of those who said we should use an existing tool, a majority said we should use what's uh, uh, in place now at that, that time. So... Um, the, yes, it's, you cannot rule out the possibility that we have to revisit this because of practical eventualities. And also, it strikes me, and it's certainly something that panel will call for regularly, is that we should keep these things under review. That seems to me to be a sensible thing to do. But I'll hand over to, to Richard on the, the wider point. Um, I think we can have a fair degree of confidence. Um, down south, the system of money advice is different to Scotland in that effectively local authorities stepped out of this world some time ago time ago when the money advice service was set up. Now, the SFS is their tool, and it's transferring to the single financial guidance body. Um, as part of putting it in place, they have the three biggest third sector providers of money advice signed up. So that's the Money Advice Trust, Step Change, and Citizens Advice England and Wales. And between them, they are the majority of free advice provision south of the border. They also have more creditors signed up than we've previously managed. So, yes, we can expect to see the, spreading, the spread of this um, further down south. Um, our opposite numbers in the insolvency service have adopted it for calculating contributions in DROs, for example. Uh, it's flagged in the Treasury's consultation for breathing space that they'll intend to use this as a way of assessing what debtors can contribute to their version of our debt arrangement scheme. Um, they are already talking to the court service and others down south. So I... I, I think there is a genuine opportunity um, to see this as a single tool. Now, it, it may not work. There have been many previous attempts to do this, none of which have worked, but this has the best chance. Um, I should also say, I, mean, I find it particularly compelling that the Money Advice Trust, who run the Common Financial Statement, have said they see the Standard Financial Statement as an evolution and as a better tool, and that is why they are moving. Um, if, if the organisation actually run the previous tool, think, think the new one is better, that, that's quite compelling. It does sound a wee bit of a step in the dark there. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's it fair, Mr Beattie. I think um, 
and I mean, you could have argued the same at the time that we passed the legislation and we said there's got to be a statutory mechanism and we put in place the CFS. So um, I don't think to characterise moving to a new mechanism as a, a step in the, the dark is a fair um, assessment. But clearly um, it is, and I've made the point that when you, you change any mechanism, you have to you have to be informed by what uh, happens on a practical basis and keep that under review. And that's something that we will, of course, commit to do. And indeed, any committee of the Scottish Parliament could undertake such a review and tell us what they think as well. Um, just, just on one point, Mr. Dennis, you said that the in England it's different in terms that the local authorities are not involved in money advice provision, whereas in Scotland they are. And is that difference reflected in what way in the SFS being applied to Scotland? Um, the, the point I was trying to make is that, so in England and Wales, they're going through the process of getting the SFS adopted by local authorities. I think something like 140 have, have made a commitment to adopting it, and they're still working in the others uh, one by one. And that's in their role as creditor. So will they accept it as a creditor? In terms of will most debtors south of the border um, go through a process using the standard financial statement? The question is, do the advice agencies use it? And because down south, there isn't... Uh, in, in Scotland, most free advice is funded by local authorities. Um, so if you are a debtor going through the free advice, you are more likely than not to be going through a process funded by a local authority. So it's, local authorities have, have a hugely important role in, in Scotland. Um, if you were working on that assumption that the situation was the same down south, your key question would be how many local authorities have signed up to using this? That, that's not the key question down south, because down south, the free debt advice comes from the Money Advice Trust, comes from Step Change, it comes from Citizens Advice, and it's funded by the Money Advice Service, drawing on the levy paid by the consumer, consumer credit sector. Um, so down south, if you're a debtor, the question is, do the, are those three agencies, those, those three third sector bodies all signed up? Because previously, Step Change had their own tool. We know the Money Advice Trust was using the common financial statement. Um, all three of those have already committed to using the standard financial statement. Step change are ready to switch on the new com computer system on the 1st of April. Citizens of Ice England and Wales have already moved to using it. Right, I'll move to questions from Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Um, <clears throat> last week when I attended the meeting uh, on the Thursday afternoon, what I took from that meeting was that a lot of people were very concerned about the administrative burden that is placed on people. And we're already debt advisors, and we're already aware that because of the accountancy and bankruptcies, evidence requirements, it's more onerous in Scotland than elsewhere, i.e. England and Wales, for that uh, evidence to be calculated and on the two evidence sessions we've had so far, this is, what, this is what we heard. If we adopt a standard financial statement, we will need to gather more information as evidence for fixed costs. The standard financial statement shifts more of these areas of expenditure across to fixed costs, which we will then need to evidence. Um, under the financial statement, categories including transport, school uniform costs, the cost of school trips, and other things that are difficult to evidence will be moved so that they always require to be evidenced. And then we will need to gather even more evidence, which will prolong the process potentially by an extra three or four weeks. So, you know, given that background of evidence, you know, do you accept that, you know, all of the debt advisors, there are many of the debt advisors, are concerned about administrative burden and, and what are we going to do about that? Self-evidently, self I have to accept that they are concerned about it. I suppose um, whether or not we feel that they need to be concerned is a matter of perspective, um, but that is fundamentally why I have committed to <coughs> um, ensuring that we can quickly move towards uh, having the guidance in place that will demonstrate that we do not want this to be a burdensome requirement. We don't want it to be 
is something that is onerous, that delays uh, the process, that um, can uh, cause difficulties for the organisation and individual money advisor providing the advice and the assistance and ultimately and fundamentally we don't want to put in place a system that's going to cause difficulties for uh, the debtor uh, as well. So that's that's what we have uh, committed uh, to doing. My um, takeaway from the meeting uh, last week was that was the fundamental point that people were expressing rather than a strong position about whichever tool it may be, because um, uh, equally, I think those concerns were, again, be candid, that the, um, those concerns were being expressed about the, the CFS as being practised now. Now, whether or not uh, the accountant bankruptcy it feels that is fair, it's something that has been stated, it's something that's been heard, and it's something that we are committed to working towards trying to bring people together to understand why that's a concern and to make sure that any guidance that's put in place and that is then taken forward on a practical basis and put into effect does not create something that is burdensome for, for people to work through. You, you've talked about tightening up the guidance. Um, it would be helpful if you gave an, an indication of what kind of areas you're looking at in order to tighten that guidance up to see if it would have an impact on the administrative burden. But you also spoke about maybe in the long term having a review. And, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, should we not have the review first? The Institute of Chartered Accounts in Scotland said in their evidence, we would strongly encourage the AIB and the Scottish Government to defer any decision on the use of CFS or SFS and instead urgently carry out an assessment of the policy effectiveness behind the CFT. So surely that would be the most sensible position, is to review it first and then decide the best way forward. Well, I suppose that would go back to the fundamental point, Mr MacDonald, is that we are coming to a juncture whereby the tool that we use just now is about to be switched off by the organisation that administers it, that created it, that licensed it, who themselves say that the tool that we propose to use is a better one than the one that they are about to turn off. So that's a juncture by which it seems sensible to me we need to make a determination about whether or not we use a tool that is increasingly not going to be used by the sector, that is not going to there's certainly not planned to be continued to be administered or have that wider stakeholder group to look at its efficacy because um, the, 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 the trust don't intend to continue, so why would they maintain that group? So ultimately yeah, it could... Until they rule it out, did they? they, they well, I, they've said nothing about continuing uh, the, uh, the steering group that they have uh, in place. I don't think they'll do that. Why would they? Because ultimately I think they would be keeping the tool in place just for the use of the accountant in bankruptcy. So it then gets to the position of, well, who's determining uh, how it's operated and so on. Um, ultimately, it could just come back to uh, the government themselves to do. Uh, now, if that's something that the committee ultimately feels is appropriate, then OK, we can we can hear that and we can can consider that. So that that's, that's really um, the juncture that causes us to consider how we move it forward. In terms of um, whether or not we should undertake that wider review, well, I would go back to the point that because we've reached that juncture, I think we need to make a decision about what we do in the immediate term. But yes, we've committed. You know, the People are saying that we should review this on a wider basis. We already intended to do that. We've committed to doing that. I'm saying it here and now, Convener. I'm on the record saying we'll do that. I'll be very keen to hear what the committee's perspective is on that. That work will be underway. Um, the, uh, this is a statutory mechanism has been in place mm -hmm. coming up five years. The average bankruptcy process lasts about five years. So for me, that seems the sort of appropriate position by which we start to look to see whether it has been uh, an effective uh, mechanism. So that's kind of why we've been working to that uh, timescale. I've talked so long about that point, Mr McDonald. I've forgotten your first question, if you could reacquaint me with it. I was just asking about the administrative burden, really, in general. The areas that we would look at. Yeah, that, you're that, going that, to change um, in the guidance. Well, I think fundamentally that's that's what it would be about, what um, the, the threshold for requiring really detailed evidence would be. There will be cases where that is necessary, and I go back to the point that we do need to have a system which creditors... Um, can buy into and have faith in as being um, proportionate and fair. Because 
let us remember there are many creditors. Credit unions are a prime example. They have um, a customer base, many of whom are, are vulnerable, could be considered as vulnerable and from low-income households themselves. And ultimately, a credit union's finances are only there because of those uh, individuals. It's their money that they are handling. So we need to take creditors with us as well. But yes, um, we need to make sure that through the guidance we put in place, the threshold of, for detailed evidence is appropriate, is proportionate and is correct. So that is the area that I would think we need to undertake the most work on. And the, the common financial tool is, is based on, a, or the statement is based on the old tool that was used by a number of debt advisors back to 2003. So there is a long history of, of it being used. And I was just wondering, um, you know, has the government done any work on and if there is another agency that could actually continue uprating the CFT and what the cost of that would be? Um, no, I don't think we have. Um, what There clearly would be a cost if we were to ask the Trust to continue doing mm -hmm. it. I don't know precisely what that would be. Um, I've got to be careful coming up to budget time, convener, so the Cabinet Secretary for Finance could be watching this, so I've got to be careful what I say, but I don't think it would break the bank for us to have to do so. Um, where the question then as to, well, one, we couldn't compel the Trust to do that long term. They may themselves determine we don't want to do this. So then the question would be, well, who is appropriate to do it? We then need to find someone. So these aren't impossibilities. I'm not suggesting that it wouldn't be possible to do these things. We would then need to consider that uh, in detail, work out who might be most appropriate to do it. Um, I suppose it could even be done in-house. The, the then is a question as to whether or not some people would feel that is appropriate. I think I saw in your first evidence session, ICAS had made, had posited that as a suggestion, but R3 immediately came back and said they did not think that was appropriate. So just as though was also suggested. Well, there, there be, could be many suggestions. We'd need to consider whether or not we thought they were appropriate and, and sensible suggestions. And I suppose the point that I was trying to make is uh, there would be a diversity of, of views in that. And just as we will never be able to satisfy everyone with whatever tool we put in place, I doubt we'd be able to satisfy everyone in respect of that decision uh, as well. But a decision could be made. Uh, I'll bring in Richard uh, on this as well. Um, I just wanted to kind of reflect back on the situation before the 2015 bad, 2014 bad ass came into force in 2015. Mm -hmm. So in, in those days, the money advisor sat down with the client and decided whether or not they needed to go bankrupt. Um, you know, could, could they cover their debts? Uh, mm -hmm. were, th were they apparently insolvent? Uh, did they have assets? So all the money advisor was focused on was whether or not their client needed to go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Bankruptcy will be awarded the case would then be referred to a trustee, and the trustee would go through the process of setting the contribution. In the period of consultation in the run-up to those reforms, it's actually gone on from about 2007 onwards to 2012-13 when the, when the policy was set. The decision was taken that the debtor ought to know what their contribution may, may or may not be before they decided whether or not to go bankrupt. As a result of that, this administrative burden of going through the financial tool, of coming up with the calculation, has been brought from after the award of bankruptcy done by the trustee to before, to before yeah. the award of bankruptcy done by the money advisor. Mm -hmm. We know that imposes a burden on money advisors that they didn't have to face before, but we went into that with our eyes open because it allowed us to put the debtor in a more informed position in making the choice. Um, and it allows us to tailor what that contribution is to their specific circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that's, that's a fundamental policy issue, but of, of course we'll be looking again at the assessment, but the fact that it has imposed administrative burden shouldn't be any surprise, because clearly we've brought a lot of work from post-award, done by somebody different, onto pre-award by the money advisor. Mm -hmm. um, of, course, of course, can we, and that's been designed with the best interests of the, the debtor at heart, which I think we would all agree is a sensible thing to do. We don't want to put people into solutions they don't necessarily have to 
to be pushing into. And of course, if you're if that's the outcome you're designing, which I think we I think money advisors would want, then they would have to be going through that process of evidence gathering anyway, so that they can make sure the person before them can make a, a fully informed decision based on their advice. Going, going back to the um, administrative burden, my last point is, uh, we again, we heard on committee that insolvency practice, practitioners and money advisors could use their professional judgment to sign certificates declaring someone insolvent, yet they're unable to do so at, uh, at the moment. Is that something you'd be willing to look at to see? Um, I wouldn't close down any option. What I would, of course, go back to say is, um, that we need to take the creditor community with us and uh, we would need to hear what they had to, to say about that. Uh, and I, I, again, I go back to the point that creditors themselves constitute a wide variety of individuals um, or organisations, some of whom themselves represent people on, on low incomes uh, and who could also be described as vulnerable. So, you know, we need to, we need to have a a system that, yes, is um, requires some level of ed evidence gathering and some level of, of sign-off, but is done so on a, a proportionate basis to look after the interests of the debtor, but also to make sure <coughs> creditors are with us as well. But I'll bring Richard yeah. in again. Oh, sorry, sorry. That, that, that's sorry. Just, that's sorry. just technically slightly wrong sorry. in the question, in the nature of the question, so um, apologies for butting in, convener, but it's important to get this right. So the insolvency practitioner and the money advisor can sign the certificate of insolvency and declare, declare the debtor apparently insolvent. What they can't do is set the debtor's contribution, um, which the law says is set by us. Well, sorry, before someone else butts in here, um, I think Jackie Bailey wanted to come in on the issues already raised. Thank you, convener. Um, I welcome the minister's commitment to additional guidance, but, but let me put it to you that Money Advice Scotland, Citizens Advice Scotland, ICAS, Alan McIntosh, all of these people sit on your common financial tool working group. They already have a voice. The evidence they've given to committees shouldn't come as a surprise because they've been raising their concerns within this group, but they're not listened to. So if their participation isn't translating into better practice, what comfort can we take from you offering more guidance and their input to developing it, given they have an input already? Who wants to button on that? I, <laughs> I do, Convener. I hope, hope you don't Good. consider it's me butting in. Um, well, I, I would hope uh, what would reassure them is that I... This is a new area to me, Ms Bailey. So I've not been involved in the process before. Uh, having heard the concerns of this committee, the first thing I determined was, well, we should withdraw the regulations because serious concerns have been raised. We shouldn't proceed as we had previously envisaged. It is incumbent on me to sit down with those involved. All those individuals and organisations were invited to the meeting with me. Not all attended, most did. Uh, that was precisely so that I could hear directly from them. That is my commitment to them, to continue doing that, so that any that guidance... For are you going to chair this working group now? I wouldn't chair the working group. Okay. What I have, uh, it, because I'm, I'm quite a busy person, Ms Bailey. Um, but, really? Uh, if it's that important, you'd uh, find time to uh, do it? I, I do find the time to engage with organisations. Yeah, that was just meant to be a bit of a jocular <laughs> remark, Ms Bailey. Um, I uh, will engage... About I'm not suggesting there is anything funny okay. about it, Ms Bailey. So um, let me go back to the fundamental okay. point I was making. I uh, committed at the meeting I held last week to engaging regularly with those organisations on a roundtable basis. I don't know if that's something that's happened in the past. It's something I found instructive and useful. I am very clear that it is I... As the Minister, we're the responsibility for this area that devises the policy. And I can only do that if I am properly and adequately informed. And part of that will be me engaging with those that were round that table on a regular basis. And that is something I'm committed to doing. Can I, can I ask you then, who chairs the working group? And uh, have you not been receiving information from that working group? Uh, I don't think it's fair to say that I've not been receiving information from okay. the working group. The working group will be meeting tomorrow. Okay. 
Uh, it's been convened quickly. Uh, it was actually scheduled to meet um, at the request of some of the participants. They uh, had uh, suggested it shouldn't. Uh, I asked the account bankruptcy to go back to them to say, well, given the, this is the position we are in, that we need to try and undertake this work quickly, please ask them to reconsider. I'm grateful that they have agreed to do that, so they'll be meeting uh, tomorrow, indicating some, hopefully, some sense of the urgency and the seriousness by which I take this uh, matter. Uh, and, uh, of course, I'll be looking to hear what was discussed there, and I will be fully involved in the process. Can, can I go back? Sorry, I'm not meaning to nitpick. I just want to okay. understand the process. Um, can I ask you again who chairs it? Sorry, yes, I'll ask. And, and can I also ask, um, if you were getting reports, were you being told about these concerns well before the regulations were laid? Uh, I'll ask Richard to come in in relation to uh, who chairs it. Clearly, I am um, relying on the accountant bankruptcy to provide me with uh, information and uh, I'm satisfied they provide me with information necessary to, to move ahead as I see fit. Um, so the meeting tomorrow will be chaired by John. Um, it's usually chaired by um, another member of my staff, but given the importance of this topic, we've, we've raised it to the Deputy Accountant tomorrow. So who's it normally chaired by? Okay. Okay. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Angela Constance. Thank you, Convener. Um, if I could follow on from some of Ms uh, Bailey's question, because I think I would like some categorical um, assurances also. Given that Mr Cook uh, said earlier, and, and I think this was an important point, that if there are fewer breaches, less evidence is required uh, to the accountants, accountants and, and bankruptcy. But if there are breaches, evidence is required to waive contributions. So I want to know specifically or the options that the Minister has to ensure uh, robust assurances that in all circumstances uh, Mr Dennis and his colleagues uh, will be proportionate and reasonable. And I wonder, you know, over and above guidance what thoughts the Minister has about that specifically? Because your role in terms of, and if you forgive me, I just like to call a spade a shovel, uh, your role in bearing down uh, on the EIB is pivotal in this circumstance. It, well, it's certainly my expectation it should be proportionate. Now, if there's, and this goes back to the point I just made to Ms Bailey, and hopefully I've made throughout my um, contribution uh, in answering questions today. If there are people out there expressing some concerns, it's incumbent on me to, to hear that. So that's why I've put and trained the, the process that is uh, currently uh, underway. Um, yes, um, I, I want to be as categorical as I can. My Not only is it my expectation, I want us to devise some form of guidance that can set that out, as much as any guidance can. It's always going to be subject to interpretation and there will ultimately be differing points of view from time to time. That is an inevitability. But as much as we can, within the form of written guidance, I want to be very clear about the uh, the the level of evidence that will be required in um, circumstances where uh, the trigger has been uh, breached. And that's, you know, it, it will speak largely to, to common sense. Where things absolutely cannot be demonstrated, then you need to reflect that in your consideration of these matters. If it's for something that can be demonstrated as a regular occurrence in terms of, of travel that can be readily assessed through looking at what public transport costs are or an assessment of what um, petrol costs are, for example, then, you know, that can be undertaken by the accountant in bankruptcy looking at any specific situation. What I will say, and it hasn't come out thus far in uh, the evidence that um, has, you've been gathering today, it came to is there is a mechanism already in place, and I can't remember the precise name of it, I'll ask John to come in and uh, remind me of that in a second, by which if an advisor is concerned that the process hasn't been proportionate or fair just now, they can seek to, to challenge it. I don't think that happens often just now. So that is, that is, that is in existence. Perhaps one element of the guidance might need to be 
reflecting that better that there is some form of racism. I'll just ask John. Yeah, of course. Come back to the show of advisors. If you for, forgive me, I uh, um, was trying to pursue a line of question that was particularly about, about, about your role as, as minister. Okay. So, in, in terms of the guidance, guidance is uh, important. Uh, the more detailed it is, uh, the better. Um, and, you know, I, I, for one, am not demurring from the central importance of guidance. But what other options do you have in terms of belt and braces approach to ensure that the AIB is reasonable and proportionate other than guidance? You know, is it appropriate or possible for there to be some sort of protocol uh, between you as the minister, the AIB and stakeholders? You know, are there uh, over and above, uh, you know, quite detailed uh, working groups? You know, are there forums that there can be ministerial oversight uh, and input into? Um, you know, what, what other options do you have to ensure that on an ongoing basis that we're not just issuing guidance mm -hmm. as a, a one-off uh, piece of action, that there is a, a, a collective endeavour to ensure, because this is the crux of it for a lot of uh, uh, your stakeholders, is that they're concerned about the burden of evidence mm -hmm. uh, and that Mr Dennis and his colleagues uh, are not reasonable and proportionate on all occasions. Uh, well, clearly I've just made the point. So there is the working group that will uh, that meets on an ongoing basis. I'll be looking to be updated uh, on an ongoing basis as to what that uh, the considerations that working group have uh, been uh, that will be informative and instructive i've already responded to ms bailey um, uh, and i think in terms of the the evidence that we're going to be providing to you as a note of the outcome of the meeting uh, within that note uh, it expressly states that i found the meeting useful and i intend to do that on a, a regular and ongoing basis so that will allow stakeholders to raise issues directly with me. What I cannot, of course, do is become involved in the direct application of a specific case. That would be entirely inappropriate for me to do so. But if I get some sense, as you can do, through people contacting you directly, parliamentarians contacting you on behalf of their constituents, that there seems to be some general issue, then that, of course, allows me to have uh, a very straight conversation with uh, Dr Dennis and uh, any of his colleagues as appropriate. Okay. Can I move on to the, the issue of um, evidence? And, and the Minister just uh, mentioned that. M Mr uh, Cook earlier, when being questioned by Mr Mason, said that uh, he believed uh, that the, the standard financial statement um, would give more folk more to live on. Um, and I wondered, um, is that just a belief or is that something you can state categorically based on the evidence that you currently have? Based on the evidence we have, the answer to that is yes. The difficulty is that trigger breaches don't necessarily mean higher contributions. It depends if the person's circumstances and whether they can evidence it and it's reasonable in these circumstances. So that's what muddies the water somewhat, I suppose. I think it's, I'd just like to add another point just to the minister, what the minister was saying. And if, how it works at the moment is a review process. If someone doesn't like their contribution, they can ask for a review. That's carried out by a separate part of the county in bankruptcy. And they can also go to the sheriff uh, to ask an appeal on a formal basis. In addition, we've got an independent uh, sort of review committee, which is made up of external stakeholders, which look at our decisions that have been reviewed to say, were those right? So that gives us this external scrutiny, allows us to reflect on our decisions and take on board any sort of criticism we get from this external stakeholder group. So we try as much as possible to be transparent in the process so that we can learn from the experiences of people who are using the service. But I think it is fair to say we, we get very, very few review requests for debtor application contribution cases, if the truth be told. I think that's a very interesting uh, point as, as well, Mr Cook. And it leads me to ask that um, in terms of you know, what committee has before it to, to decide upon, there doesn't appear 
to be any uh, direct consultation um, with debtors on the approach to assessing uh, income uh, or indeed of their uh, experience uh, more broadly on statutory debt solutions. And I just wonder if, again, that's something that the Minister will yeah. reflect on and rectify. Um, yes. So what uh, I've already said very clearly, that we're going to be undertaking uh, a, a review of the legislation. We will do that. We will seek to involve um, it debtors in that process. Of course, accounting bankruptcy are in contact with debtors on a regular basis, so that um, will be uh, instructive. But yes, on a, a formal basis, it will do so. And clearly, when we propose, as we did in this case, of course, I know that one of the elements of your letter to me was a concern about the process of consultation in the lead up to this. We followed the, the normal process of consultation that we would with any form of legislative change. So. If there was to be legislative changes arising, it would be a normal uh, process of consultation. And any individual, including people with direct experience as a debtor, would be able to contribute to that consultation. So, um, but yeah, I, I think it probably is um, a fair uh, point that, and I think there can be a tendency, and committees and uh, the government can be uh, um, subject to, to this um, Problem. It's a challenge for us as legislators, convener, that when we engage in consultation, you usually hear mainly and most directly from what we call stakeholders, the organisations themselves. And there is always that challenge to, to try and reach out to others who want to, who we want to engage with. And in this case, clearly, we would want to engage with debtors. So, but yes, we will make sure that's part of the process. Yeah, because okay. I mean, I, I mean, again, I'm conscious, Minister, forgive me, convener that um, we can all diligently follow the processes that are expected of us, either as uh, you know, a committee uh, or indeed uh, as, as a minister. But the reality is uh, there are some folk that are harder to reach. Um, there are other areas of government where we've worked very hard to overcome that uh, in terms of those with the uh, lived experience of the social security system, uh, those with lived experience of, of, of homelessness. So, you know, um, you know what what further endeavour, what further specific endeavour do you think the minister and his officials can make to uh, reach in those that we need to reach, bearing in mind they can be difficult to reach? Well, I, I mean, I suppose that was the point I was speaking to. It is always an inherent uh, challenge for us, and I think we would all recognise that, and it is an inherent frustration. I would, um, and <coughs> clearly. Uh, Ms Constance was um, uh, involved in the process of trying to widen out the, the reach for the um, Social Security Bill and how we devise Social Security Agency so we can learn from previous experience. What I, I can say is that um, the, through the process of ongoing engagement that uh, Count Bankruptcy has been undertaking, uh, a survey of those with direct experience, the results are being collated just now. So that was the point I was trying to make where there is that regular engagement. So I can't say what the answers are uh, just now because we're going through the, the, the collation. Survey, is it phone calls? Is it face-to-face -face well, contact? Ask, is it um, focus groups? I'll ask John to speak on that. And, and Sorry, I'll ask John. Yeah, to media, we, we normally write to people to ask for consent uh, to put it in a survey. So we've done that through IPs, uh, money advisors, creditors uh, and debtors, people actually who are experiencing uh, the, the, the system. And the feedback from that actually has been very, very positive in the past and we, we hope that continues. But we just need to try and learn lessons from the experience. In the current process, we get that through the advice sector because they, they sort of advocate on behalf of their clients. But this gives us a chance to actually speak directly to the people who experience the system. And we will report on that. We will produce a, a release on that and give detail as to you know, what people think of our service. OK, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. And um, I'm conscious of time, but we'll, we'll move on now to uh, John Mason for the question. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Maybe a short one. Um, I, I realise that both the Common Financial Statement and the Standard Financial Statement are controlled by outside bodies. And uh, so whichever one we go with, uh, we don't have full control of it, but they are tied into legislation. So, so how, what would happen if the, in future the standard financial statement was changed quite, say, dramatically? I mean, perhaps for political reasons it became harsher for debtors. Uh, that would be a decision uh, made in England. Uh, so 
what would how would we react to that? Well, I, I don't think that form of characterisation of the, the process is necessarily how it would work in, in practice. And I would make the point, as I've alluded to earlier, that, um, and I suppose I can understand why people have come to this conclusion, because we're moving from a system that has been used on a widespread, standardised basis in Scotland to one that's going to be used on a wider basis across the UK. And there's been some suggestion about a loss of direct influence or control. You yourself, Mr Mason, made the point that ultimately these are products operated by uh, organisations that aren't directly in the gift of the Scottish Government. But what I can say is, by contrast to the steering group that existed, which by my estimation is not likely to exist for the CFS because the Money Advice Trust doesn't intend to continue it, to the equivalent group of organisations for the SFS, we actually have more Scottish representation on that for the SFS through Citizens Advice Scotland, through Money Advice Scotland and through the accountant in bankruptcy. So we actually have more influence. That said, you cannot preclude the possibility that um, the tool develops in such a way that you feel it isn't what you want to, to utilise uh, going forward. That could have happened with the CFS just as much as it could with the SFS. Then we need to make a judgement and we may then need to uh, alter the system going forward. We couldn't, have we couldn't have precluded that possibility with the CFS either. And then we come back to the committee saying this is what we intend to do and seek the committee's consent or assent, I should say. OK, thank you. And Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> just a brief <clears throat> follow-up to your earlier comments, Minister, on, on, on the guidance. Just, just for clarity, in relationship to things like the... Um, uh, the um, allowances for, for travel, the, the guidance can't change the fact that the allowance is zero, but the guidance could change the, or could be, could be um, determinative, determinative of the kinds of evidence that were, would be required. Is that <laughs> what you're saying? It, well, yes and no. I think the first uh, point I would say is I think there's a tendency to look at these as uh, allowances, and I think the community that uh, is uh, involved in uh, the provision of advice would also say that actually it's not intended to be a but that's probably slightly a, a moot uh, point but yes in essence it's about how the guidance that we put in place uh, to uh, implement this on a practical basis i think that was very clear to me uh, mr whiteman from the uh, discussion I had that that's the concern as stands now with the current uh, tool um, through CFS and it would be the case with the SFS. So ultimately it's what we do on a practical basis, implementing whatever tool we have before us that I think is the critical thing for the uh, advisors and for the organisations in uh, that are involved in supporting uh, debtors. And that's something I am uh, very committed to uh, trying to get right I think, self-evidently, given the concerns you have had as a committee, I'm going to need to get that right if the committee is going to agree to any change. OK, thank you. And you said earlier that we're at this juncture because of the impending ending of the maintenance of the Common Financial Statement. Uh, my understanding is when the AIB undertook its consultation, two-thirds uh, of those who responded said they d didn't agree with this, this uh, standard financial uh, statement. Um, and we're interested in alternatives, but no work has been done to explore um, alternatives. Clearly, one alternative would be to continue the common financial mm -hmm. statement, conduct a review um, of the methodology to determine how much money a debtor's left with, minimum living standards, setting trigger figures, etc., and then make a decision as to whether we embrace the standard financial statement or not. I wouldn't necessarily posit these as contradictory or alternatives. I wouldn't also say that it's... I don't think it would be fair to say there's no, not been any work undertaken. So, for example, minimum uh, income uh, standards have been suggested as, a, as an alternative, and there has been an assessment undertaken, which shows that broadly uh, the SFS results in the, the same uh, outcome. So I don't think there's been no work undertaken. What I do agree is that more work can be uh, undertaken, and we've already committed to, to doing that. In, in, in what kind, so I think the criticism 
has been that the kind of this, the kind of work we're talking about here is work that would inform a decision as to whether to move to the standard for national statement. And in the absence of that work, we're being asked to make, we're being invited to make the change purely because one, the current tool is being discontinued when in fact there are bridging mechanisms. We could keep that tool going. Potentially, yes. Um, whether or not that would be a satisfactory process is um, probably a matter of perspective. Uh, I would think that there could be any number of concerns raised from a, a number of uh, stakeholders about us having that bridging process uh, in terms of uh, having uh, a variety of tools for different assessments, um, having to operate more than one of them. Also, whether or not it's appropriate that the organisation who currently operates and licenses has himself said that they think the alternative that we seek to move to is better, but then asking them to maintain it solely for our utilisation, is that an appropriate uh, thing to do? Again, I wouldn't say that, I, I don't think it's fair to characterise the process that's been undertaken thus far as no work being uh, having been pursued. I've made the point that um, there's been an assessment uh, of a comparison between the CFS and the SFS. I think a fairly comprehensive one. I've already made the point that if the committee thinks there's more we can do in relation to that, and we can do it, we will uh, do so. So uh, I, I just, uh, I'm not quite convinced that the argument that we've not done anything here in the lead up to it can be held up to be true. Okay, thank you. Right, well, thank you very much. That concludes our questions on this at this time. Um, thank you to the Minister and uh, Mr. Dennis and Mr. Cook for coming in today. I'll suspend the session for uh, a change over witnesses. Uh, we turn now to item, uh, agenda item number three, the Insolvency Scotland Receivership and Winding Up Rules 2018, which is SSI number 347. And uh, I would welcome the Minister again, Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills, and also the officials with him, uh, Graham Fisher, uh, Head of uh, Branch Legal Directorate, Constitutional and Civil Law, the Scottish Government, Alex Reid, who's the Head of Policy Development, and David Farr, Policy Manager, Corporate Insolvency from the Accountant and Bankruptcy. And I'll start first by asking the Minister to give a brief outline of the purpose of the instrument. I'll speak very uh, briefly, uh, convener, because I'm happy to, to take questions of the, the committee. It wants to ask any. Uh, I think my letter of the, the 20. 8th of November, aimed to set out the background to uh, this instrument, I recognise um, it is seemingly 
or not seemingly, it is a very uh, weighty uh, document uh, that is uh, by necessity because the rules it seeks to reg uh, replace uh, were similarly so. It's largely an exercise at updating those rules from legislation passed now over 30 years ago, designed to update the, the language that's used around them, designed to make the, uh, the rules a bit more transparent for people to uh, be able to understand those involved in the provision of uh, advice and uh, the insolvency uh, solutions. Um, so it's, it's really just a, a very straightforward exercise in updating the rules that are in place, not substantially changing them, but modernising them and making them easier to understand. Thank you, Minister. Are there any questions from committee members to the Minister on this instrument? If there's no questions, I'll suspend the meeting to allow the uh, witnesses to leave. Thank you very much for coming in.